I'm going to uh, introduce Navi. Um, Navi is a innovation and leadership strategist. And he's a columnist for the Harvard Business Review. He wrote a book that all of you have uh, in your bags uh, called Jugad Innovation. And he's going to talk about that um, central concept and what that means. When we were thinking about programming this day, what we wanted to do is start really big and wide and open up our minds a little bit to uh, how we think, how we can um, think differently and approach problems in a different way. And at Kenshu uh, and with the, the companies and the partners we work with, for us, uh, innovation is not just something that you do, you know, uh, to be cool or to be different, but it's about um, solving real problems. And Navi's got some great examples to walk through about how you can solve fundamental problems by taking new approaches. So please join me in welcoming Navi Raju. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Aaron, for that kind introduction. I wish I can have your jacket. I feel I'm really overdressed. By, uh, I live in Palo Alto, so it's already like, you know, too much. Um, and I will just grab, uh, I think you have the clicker or, yeah, thank you so much. So, um, so I'm going to spend about 45 minutes introducing you to a new approach to innovation that in a way goes back to the essence of what is innovation, which is essentially, as sometime I describe, is to kind of uh, reawaken the kid in you. Uh, and there's one adult kid that most of you, and I'm betraying my age, knows very well, which is MacGyver, uh, you know, the TV action hero that can pull himself out of any problem simply using a Swiss Army knife and, you know, duct tape sometimes. So, so that's what I want to discuss about, like, how do you kind of unleash this MacGyver instinct that you have within a corporate setting? So when we talk about uh, innovation, and interestingly, the, the Kinshu's, you know, kind of tagline for this event is actually, Infinite, vision, infinite innovation. And um, most companies actually have done innovation believing that they have infinite resources. And therefore, since World War II, if you look at it, what happened is that companies have spent billions of dollars in research and development with the hope that money can buy innovation. To the point where it's estimated that in 2011 alone, the world's largest companies spent about $600 billion in research and development. And yet, Booz & Company, which is a consulting firm, shows that there is no correlation between how much you invest in R&D and how innovative you are, as measured by the new products we launch every year or any financial metrics uh, for those companies. As a matter of fact, as you may know, the top three most innovative companies in terms of uh, ranking that are namely Apple, Google, and 3M spend far less as a percentage of the revenues on R&D compared to <clears throat> someone like Microsoft. Uh, so clearly, there is no correlation between how much you spend in R&D and how innovative you really are, right? So as a result, most CEOs are like this, this guy wearing this T-shirt that says, we spent $2 billion in R&D, and all we got was this lousy T-shirt. So a lot of disappointment in the C-suite. So if I have been consulting. Uh, I was an analyst at Forrester Research for about 10 years and helping large uh, American companies and European companies to understand or identify what is causing this problem, which is on one hand, they invest so much in R&D, on the other hand, they are not necessarily you know, that innovative in the marketplace. So one main reason we discovered is because these companies are stuck in what I call processes. Uh, these processes like Six Sigma are fantastic when the world is stable, and it makes things more repeatable by standardizing your activities, but they become a handicap when the world becomes more volatile and more unpredictable. And this is something that uh, General Electric, an industrial giant, learned the hard way because as Beth Comstock, their CMO, says here, our traditional teams are too slow, we are not innovating fast enough, and we need to systematize change. And this is important for this company because for 100 years, they were an industrial company, right? Think about Thomas Edison, big R&D labs. But what happened is that now they are believing that in the next five to 10 years, the biggest competitor will not be a Honeywell or Siemens, but Google and IBM. Why is that? Because with things like the Internet of Things, right, where old physical objects are connected, what's going to happen is that it doesn't matter how big is your you know, wind turbine you sell or the industrial automation software you sell. What happens is that these companies like IBM and Google could actually connect these devices, industrial devices, and start getting big data and offer services that leverage the big data. So suddenly, they realize that they are no longer playing in the industrial market anymore. 
but they are becoming more a digital company. But the problem is that these companies has invested so much in Six Sigma kind of processes that have kind of stuck them or straight jacketed them in a very rigid environment, and now they have to learn to innovate faster, better, cheaper. So we told ourselves, me and my uh, co-authors of my book a few years ago, four years ago, we said, okay, clearly we have three, three big weaknesses in the existing innovation model. The first one is that it's very expensive, $600 billion. The second inefficiency is that it's relatively rigid and inflexible. And the third kind of shortcoming is that it's a bit elitist, right? Because there's a perception that only a few scientists, engineers in the company can innovate, not recognizing that with things like Facebook and social media, innovation has to open up and include everyone in the ecosystem to bring in their ideas as well and co-innovate with them. The current model doesn't allow for that. So we set ourselves a goal and said, you know what? What if we can find a different model that has three counter attributes, namely something that will be more cost effective, that will give you more flexibility, and thirdly, will be more open and collaborative, so you can actually you know, bring in everyone in the ecosystem as co-innovation partners. So we told ourselves, where can we find this alternative model? We said, let's go to emerging markets like India, Africa, and Brazil, because they are still growing relatively well, uh, despite all the kind of you know, economic situation around the world, and we tried to understand how innovators in those companies think and act, and how they're different than the folks you know, in the West. So what we discovered, first of all, is that the kind of questions that innovators ask themselves in emerging markets is very different than the questions we ask ourselves here when we innovate. So let me give an example. Let's say you are an engineer working for an appliance company, Whirlpool or you know, Seb or Bosch Appliances, right? or even Samsung that makes these fridges. Well, you might come to work Monday morning thinking, what if you can invent a fridge that can talk to a smartphone? Makes sense, most of us in the West, we have a fridge at home, and we all have you know, a phone, and uh, it would be nice if I get a text message saying that I run out of milk, and I can fetch a gallon of milk on the way back home, right? That makes bloody good sense. But someone in India asked himself a big what if question, which is, what if you can invent a fridge that does not consume electricity? That is a big what if question, because 600 million Indians do not have access to electricity. Now, this big question was not asked by someone with a PhD from MIT or an MBA from Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School, but by someone who did not even finish high school. His name is Mansuk Prachapati. He's the inventor of the world's greenest fridge. It's called Mithi Cool. It's made entirely of clay. It's a potter by training. And it's 100% biodegradable and can keep fruits and vegetables fresh for five days and milk fresh for two days. Okay? It cost about 25 bucks. It's a godsend in the village where he lives because food supply is erratic and they have no electricity. So it's an aspirational product, right? Because it looks like a fridge and yet adapts to the local context and the local needs as well. So the first thing we discover in emerging markets is that scarcity is the mother of invention. So probably I was a biologist in my past life, so I said, okay, I know who's the mother. I need to figure out who's the father. I have to do a DNA test on that. So we discovered the father of you know, invention in emerging markets is adversity. And it's very interesting because we as human beings, when we face problems, adversity, we have two reactions, fight or flight. Either we confront the problem or we get out of the way. But in emerging markets, there is a third path where, like alchemists, they are able to transmute adversity and constraints into opportunity to create value for themselves and for their fellow beings. And this is the example of Kanak Das, a young man, not even an entrepreneur, uh, you know, he was basically riding his bicycle to work every day in his village in the northeastern part of India, and the village roads were filled with potholes and bumps that slowed him down. So imagine you're an engineer for Ford or Volkswagen, your instinct would be what? To create shock absorbers, right? That could counteract the problem, which is the bumps. So this guy thought differently. Rather, what he did is he actually created this makeshift device that he attached to his bike that systematically converts every bump into acceleration energy. So the more bumps in the road, the faster the bike rides. Okay? So that is you know, a really interesting way of thinking, right, of the problem, right? Turn it into an advantage. So we see a lot of this kind of frugal tinkering, this kind of MacGyver spirit in emerging markets across the board. So this is in Africa, very common to recharge your cell phone using a bicycle. So to the point where Nokia even invented an accessory kit to that effect. And, uh, 
it, this is in Philippines. It's called Litter of Light. It's a recycled plastic bottle containing bleached water that refracts sunlight and produces the equivalent of a 55 watt bulb. Very convenient because it costs only one dollar and is deployed in about one million shantytown homes in Philippines that often get affected by the typhoons. You saw in the news, right? So this is a very ad hoc way to quickly bring in light inside these dark shanty towns, right? So, and this is in Peru, a country that is uh, affected by, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, aridity because it has 95% humidity and only one inch of rainfall every year. So a local engineering college set up these big advertising billboards that convert humidity in the air into up to 100 liters of drinkable water every day, okay? They can literally, literally produce water out of thin air. That's amazing, think about it, right? Think about how many advertising billboards you see on highways and how we can use it in places like Texas, Arizona, all these dry places. And of course, now what's happening is that you begin to see companies in emerging markets applying this frugal tinkering on a large scale to create affordable and sustainable solutions for a bigger audience. So you heard about the $2,000 car called the Nano, which was invented by this company called Tata Group. And this was the visionary former chairman, Ratan Tata, who conceived it. And um, this was the world's cheapest car. And this is important because when you're an innovator, one thing to remember is that sometimes people will laugh at you when you come up with something like a $2,000 car idea. And then eventually, everyone thinks this is the greatest thing because the next big frontier for car makers is to create what we call the ultra compact cars. And uh, we'll give an example of that, how companies like Renault and Nissan are getting into this business as well. And in Detroit also, they're looking at it carefully as well. So this is happening on a large scale. And um, not only on the product side, but also on the services side. This is Dr. Devi Chetty, is a cardiologist in southern India. He can perform a heart surgery for $3,000. In America, it costs $50,000. Okay. And he can do that on large scale because he operates what is called health campuses. These are uh, big hospitals with 5,000 beds. And somebody asked me once a question, you know, can you scale up compassion? And the answer is yes, he can do it because he can operate on the richest people in India as well on the poorest people as well. He uses a tiered pricing model. Okay? Everyone can afford now a heart surgery. It's not a luxury anymore. Okay? Uh, so he actually even opened a campus in Cayman Islands to cater to the American patients as well. Okay? Um, and, uh, but finally, I think that one continent that is becoming the next frontier for this kind of frugal tinkering is going to be Africa. Um, as a side note, by the way, does anyone know by 2050 which country will, be, will have the third largest population in the world? Any guess? We know India, right? We know China, you know, we know these billions. Nigeria. Bingo, very smart people, you guys. Nigeria, by 2050, will have 750 million people. 750 million, third largest country in the world, okay? This continent is gonna set the standard for many innovations, especially in your field, especially because of the explosion of mobile telephony. To give you an idea, today in the world, there are more mobile phones than toilets, okay? I know it's shocking, right? So again, think about what I said, adversity. Either you laugh at it, or you say, well, you know, it's not right, you know, we need to have sanitation. Or you celebrate the fact that, gee, everyone has a cell phone. What can I do with it, right? So that's what they're doing in Africa. They're using mobile phone to completely leapfrog entire stage of development. For example, they are using mobile phones in Kenya to send, receive money without having a bank account, without having bank account. Today, 16 million Kenyans use the solution that's the largest number of people who have a bank account in Kenya. And 10% of the GDP is transacted already to this service, okay? And not only that, it gets even more interesting because if this means that they will never have in Kenya a formal banking system, that's what it means. Africa will never have maybe ever a banking system. If that's the case, the next question is what else they don't need? Well, maybe do they really need a utility industry? Well, what's happening is that the same company that launched this, M-Pesa, has started up something called M-Copa. So the idea is that it allows people in Kenya to buy this solar system, solar lantern system. So it's a base station. It can recharge these solar lanterns as well as your cell phone. And you just pay off using your mobile payment. And the moment you paid it off, like a leasing model, then you own the system for life, okay? So think about also how 
mobile telephony could become the foundation for procuring energy, healthcare, education, and financial services as well. Okay? And that's why I think that Kenya is going to be, or Africa is going to be the next frontier. As a matter of fact, so you know, IBM opened the first ever lab in Nairobi last October. And you should really look at it because there's a long waiting queue, waiting list, apparently within IBM, for the researchers in Japan, Europe, and America to go work in Africa. Because that's where they think they're going to be defining the next frontier for innovation, especially around mobile technologies. Um, so, but then, you know, people ask me, like, you know, but this kind of, you know, MacGyver stuff, I mean, can we apply that to where the West is really good at, which is send man to the moon or explore Mars, Jupiter, you name the planet? Well, it's true that, you know, we are very good at that, right? I mean, NASA, for example, spent $700 million of taxpayers' money, our money, uh, and five years to develop this thing called MAVEN which is a satellite that is going to be orbiting around Mars, right, to see if, you know, what will exist in Mars. Um, but India, three weeks before last November, did something amazing. They also sent a mission to Mars, except they did that 10 times cheaper and three times faster. Okay? <laughs> what they did is they reused a lot of existing components from previous missions. They did a lot of soft stimulation, simulation, sorry, okay, to accelerate the development time, and they had the spacecraft orbit Earth longer than needed to gather more velocity to propel itself towards Mars, okay? Very MacGyver spirit, right? And uh, so again, this is something you will hear more and more, this notion of a frugal science, which is gonna be exploding as well, especially with access to a lot of, you know, shared open source kind of tools that we have now. So even scientific in inventions can be done in a very MacGyver fashion. And you can see that, you know, emerging markets are proving they can do it. But in our book, what we try to do is basically not just to showcase all these ingenious solutions that sound very exciting to you know, listen or watch, but rather we said, okay, you know, this is what we can see the, at the top of the iceberg, tip of the iceberg, but what is underneath? Is there some kind of you know, secret sauce, secret methodology that we can package, write a book, and become a millionaire? So that was my dream, I guess. But uh, sadly, um, we couldn't find any formula. Damn. So, there goes my retirement fund. I'm screwed. So um, instead, we discover that all these entrepreneurs share a very unique mindset. So it's all about a mindset. So what is that mindset? Well, we couldn't find the exact term for it. So we use a Hindi word from India. It's called jugad. And the jugad means the ability to improvise an effective solution in adverse circumstances using limited resources. When you face problems and you don't have resources, you don't give up you look inside yourself and you find that you're very abundant in one area, which is ingenuity. So you tap into that to deal with these outside problems. And uh, this term is actually known in different other ways around the world. Jetino, as they say in Brazil, Shizhu uh, Shuangxin in China, which is becoming a hot concept in China because they want to move away from copycat innovation to indigenous innovation, as they call it, something that is you know, homegrown. Uh, System Day, they call it in France. And then good old America, we call it DIY, do it yourself, which by itself is becoming a big market as you will see in a few minutes. Um, but if you ask me what is really Jugad about, you know, as I said, for me it's really you know, the MacGyver spirit, right? So I actually studied, I'm a French national, so I studied in Paris and I watched him actually uh, you know, speak in French you know, in the TV episodes. But he was one of my heroes because um, unlike James Bond, you know, this guy didn't have fancy suits, you know, he only was wearing some lavish you know, shirts sometime, but more importantly, he didn't have expensive you know, gadgets like Mag Mag uh, uh, James Bond. He only relied on any resources he could find. And, uh, and I think for me, that's kind of you know, where we are heading towards is, you know, don't expect the world to give you everything you want. Try to improvise with what you already have, right? And that, for me, is really the spirit of you know, MacGyver. And, um, but this kind of MacGyver spirit, we have a term for it in this country. We call it Yankee ingenuity. And this is something that the founding fathers of this country had in the beginning. In 1741, Ben Franklin, who was a serial entrepreneur before that term was even invented, actually invented many of these amazing inventions. This is called the Franklin stove uh, that could create more heat in the house because in those times, remember, they were using chimney, right? There was no radiators, right? So it could create twice more heat using four times less wood, okay? More for less. So, and he never patented his inventions. He was a pioneer of open source. He said, I will never patent my inventions because it has to benefit society, right? And a century later, uh, this guy in Virginia, uh, McCormick, came up with this mechanized reaper 
that unleashed waves of productivity in the agricultural farm sector and leading to the industrial revolution as well. So these guys tinkered. This guy invented not in his garage, but in his barn, literally. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, Ben Franklin tinkered in his home, right? So these people essentially only relied on ingenuity. They didn't have many resources. They didn't have fancy labs, right? And yet, that's what AI ingenuity was about. And if you apply it in a corporate context, what it comes down to is, for me, Jugad or this Yank Ingenuity is a little bit like, you know, operating like a jazz band, very improvised, very fluid. And you can see that they don't need a big, you know, auditorium like this to perform. They perform in the street. Very different than what happened in the last two centuries, right? We gradually went from this model, very improvised, very frugal, to this model, which looks more like an orchestra, right? Big auditorium, very top-down way of performing, and we all play from predefined notes. If you change a note, you're in trouble, right? So the question, therefore, we ask ourselves is, you know, how do we, in a way, rekindle this kind of MacGyver spirit inside a large organization? So in other words, how do you integrate both approaches? So that's what the book uh, that you have in your bag will kind of give you some insight into, is how essentially you bring back that kind of tinkering spirit, this kind of MacGyver spirit, into a large company. So while you can read the book you know, on the way back home, what I want to do essentially is kind of synthesize some um, you know, key lessons from uh, the book. And the way I thought I would do that is by giving you some best practices, something practical you can take home. So I have about, I believe, 10 uh, best practices I want to share with some real life examples now. So the first best practice uh, I have seen uh, in my experience is that uh, it's important to create a space and time to do this kind of corporate tinkering, as I call it, right? So tinkering happens only when you have a dedicated unit, and this unit doesn't have to be big, and that's extremely important. It has to be very, very frugal, very lean, except that it's not about how many resources that unit has, but how much freedom it has. So the first example I want to give is SNCF. So you may not know who they are, but SNCF is the French railway company. Uh, opened up to competition since 2010 with the liberalization of the railway sector there. So that forced them to really think about how can we innovate faster, better, cheaper. So as you know, France is a pioneer in high-speed trains. You know, they are very, very good at that. But they realize is that developing a high-speed train takes five years to 10 years, cost a lot of money, but a, a train is like an iPhone. It's a great platform, but an iPhone value, as you know, is in the iApps, right? That tap the platform. So they said, what is the equivalent of the iApps for the, the train? Well, it's the services, the stuff that you offer to customers. That's how they can experience the value of you know, the product, the platform, right? So they said, how can we innovate faster, better, cheap, cheaper in terms of services? So they set up a specific unit. They brought in someone from AOL and uh, someone who come from the digital world. And uh, that lady actually had only two other people working with her, only three people, a budget that is next to nothing. I can reveal that very, very small budget, but a lot of freedom. And, then, and the idea was that within six months, they have a mandate to pick five to six game-changing kind of you know, service ideas, test it out, prototype it, validate it, create a business case, and then scale it up. Everything in six months. So the message is that Corporate tinkering can happen even within a large company. This company has a, over 220,000 employees, right? Think about this behemoth, right? And yet, they can innovate like a startup now. It was set up in 2008, this unit, and five years la later, they're kicking butt. Uh, they've introduced these amazing services now that has positioned this company as leader in you know, high-speed train services. So the key message is that, as you can see here, corporate tinkering is not just about how much more resources you put in, but how much more empowerment you give to employees. And that's, I think, the new formula for creativity in the 21st century. Um, the second example of that is, uh, second best practice is, you know, make sure that you know, everyone in the company have a chance to be a kid, or I call it MacGyver, right? So Ford has done that very well. Um, they are partnered with a company called TechShop, and uh, I don't know if you know them, who they are, but TechShop is essentially uh, creating a platform where uh, you can have access to a lot of industrial tools, uh, manufacturing equipment kind of stuff, that cost a fraction of what you might have uh, required in the past when you're setting up a factory. So what it means is that you know, today you can use 3D printing, right, to make any physical object you want. And I think there will be even a take giveaway, I think, you know, end of the day for you. And um, so I'm shortening the story. So what they did is the following. 
Ford recognized that when they have the engineers innovate within the company, they don't come up with the more disruptive ideas. And the reason is because they are very structured, you know, they have the bosses breathing on the neck, and any, any moment that engineer says, I have a crazy idea, the boss thinks it's the stupidest idea I ever heard, uh, or she heard. So essentially, the environment within Ford was not conducive for this kind of tinkering. So what they did is, in Detroit, they opened, they took an old factory, a warehouse, and they converted it into what I call a playground. I, that's really a playground, right? So the idea is to say, the moment a Ford engineer files a patent, he gains access, one year free access to this playground, this tech shop playground. And the idea is that there you go, and nobody will ask any questions. You can tinker with anything you have as an idea. And of course, what happens is that you can see these four employees, you know, kind of playing with whatever they want, you know, making like small planes, whatever it is. But this is called lateral thinking, is that they allows them to think outside the box without feeling the pressure of being judged. No one is judging them what they do. But what happens is that because of that, these guys come up with crazy ideas that they prototype, test here, and then bring it back into Ford to create a commercial product. So long story short, what happened is that because of this approach, Ford has managed to increase the number of patentable ideas by 40% while reducing their R&D spend by a big amount. I cannot reveal that, a big double digit, okay? So what it means is that essentially, when you give the employees not just the time, Google is famous for the 20%. The other dimension was this time, the other dimension is a space. You need to create a space, a playground, where they can become like the kids. And that's what they did. So this is powerful because it shows that actually, again, money doesn't buy innovation. It's not about a matter of money. It's about creating the right context for people to play and you know, not be judged what they do. And, um, and this is fabulous because actually they know, now they want to enlarge this contribution to this model. And, uh, and uh, BMW is going to also, the rival, is going to also partner with TechShop to open a similar thing in Munich, in Germany, April 2015. So this is a new model that is emerging as well, is to how do you create a physical playground, I call it, where people can actually go and tinker with these you know, tools. Um, now, that's the second best practice. Third best practice. Um, you know, <laughs> sometimes culture is hard to change, as Peter Drucker said, right? He said famously that, you know, don't try to change the culture. Try to kind of, you know, use it to your advantage. So, General Electric, I said earlier, is a culture, you know, relatively, uh, you know, rigid, relatively kind of, you know, traditional industrial company. So what uh, Beth Comstock is trying to do, as you can see here, you know, in this very light kind of, uh, you know, mood she is right now, um, is essentially to engage external thinkers. So one way she's doing it is actually by leveraging people like uh, TechShop. I gave you an example earlier, right, with Ford. Is Mark Hatch is the CEO of TechShop. She's um, running an incubator in um, San Francisco called Rock Health, and she's looking into, um, Jennifer Tesher, looking into financial inclusion, which is a big problem in this country because 68 million Americans today lack access to financial services, 68 million, right? So she's looking at new business models to include more Americans into financial service system. And what I did is I tried to create a panel discussion in San Francisco where I brought her, Beth Comstock, to show who she's partnering with. So let's start one by one and see how they are partnering with these outside you know, thinkers, right? So let's talk with Rock Health. So Rock Health is an incubator uh, in San Francisco, which is creating a revolution in healthcare system by developing software uh, um, startups that come up with the digital products and digital services to optimize healthcare delivery. So one of the incubated companies is uh, CellScope, that essentially makes these uh, access accessories that you can attach to your iPhone and you can convert it into otoscope. So mother can see if a daughter has an ear infection without having to go to see a, you know, a doctor. Okay? And you can swap that attachment with another attachment and voila, it becomes a dermoscope. You can also see if your skin condition is okay. And the kicker is that this attachment cost 10% roughly of the lowest end segment product used by physicians, okay? So this is a big thing coming in the healthcare sector. It's called the consumerization of medical devices. That means that more power is giving, given to us citizens to take over the control of our own health, okay? People call it about also predictive medicine as opposed to you know, you know, the 
classic way of you know, treating problems. So this is the first thing GE is doing, is that they are partnering with these you know, outside startups because they also make medical devices, but they cannot innovate the way that these guys are doing. Um, the second thing that their GE is doing also is partnering with the, the makers, right? The makers is a big movement starting, as you know. It's essentially everyday citizens having a chance to showcase the MacGyver you know, inventions. It began here in uh, California, in uh, San Mateo, and uh, today about half a million people show up to this event. Uh, New York has launched its own uh, maker uh, week. Every third week of September is declared by former Mayor Bloomberg as a maker week, and this is exploding. So think about, you know TEDx, right, TED Talks. So this is the next thing. Like TED Talk, this is gonna explode. Every city is gonna host it, right? It, was hap it happened in Rome last year in September. The whole city has to be shut down. It was so popular. It's gonna take place in Paris as well in June. This is coming everywhere. So what GE said is like, okay, if every citizen is able to invent now, how do we collaborate with them? How do we kind of you know, engage them in our system? So for that, they launched a new business unit called GE Garages. Uh, it's essentially these mobile trucks uh, that uh, you know, include inside these uh, tooling equipment where people can hop in and uh, use the tools to create any kind of physical product they want. Some of this will be for fun, so you can go on Pinterest, see some of the stuff that these guys have come up with. But if some of these solutions have a commercial value, then G wants to talk to you, okay? And that's the message, right? The idea is you know, to see how among the citizens they could find the next big thing. And, um, and as I said, TechShop is actually becoming this platform where you can have everyday citizens come and unleash the MacGyve instinct to come up with crazy products, right? Some of them could be like, you know, fun stuff, you know, you just want to impress your, you know, your friends or family, but sometimes it could become very serious. As a matter of fact, the next big startups or next startups are going to be launched with the PO box in tech shop. It's already happening. Here's an example. This guy invented a foldable kayak. Think about it. <laughs> It's based in startup in San Francisco, and they're selling like hotcakes, okay? So the next wave of digital startups won't be just software startups. These are people who are going to be make stuff. What's happening, therefore, is that the cost of making stuff is going down. You don't need a big factory anymore to make this kind of stuff. And so General Electric is partnering now with people like Quirky. Uh, Quirky is interesting. It's something that was founded by this young man who was only 23 when he started it, uh, Ben Kaufman, based in New York. And what they do is that this is the head of research of General Electric. This is Beth Comstock, the CMO. And essentially, he oversees a big R&D program within GE, right? But they come up with amazing patents that many of the patents, they don't really use them. So because they have an idea within GE, they come up with, but they don't know how to commercialize it. So the notion was, rather than keeping these patents for ourselves, what if we can put it in the public place and we can have entrepreneurs come, license it, build solutions themselves, and we just get a licensing fee out of that. So that's what the platform enables, Quirky. So because of that, you have these amazing guys who use Quirky platform to gain access, like uh, Jake Zian, who has come up with this power strip that is adjustable. Remember, this is the big problem. Think about it, right? All the stuff we have is very linear, very rigid, right? He came up with this adjustable one, okay? And what's amazing now is that um, Quirky has also partnered now uh, with uh, retailers like Auchan, which is a big European retailer. So what it means is that someone can take an invention from GE, license it, make a product, and then you have a big retailer waiting to sell it, okay? Think about how the MacGyvers now, because it's nice to be a MacGyver, but how do you sell the product, right? Well, first of all, you can get access to some technology as a baseline, build on it, and then you have a retailer waiting to sell for you, right? So this is a whole new value chain which is emerging right now. So another best practice, number four, and I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try to go a bit faster, sorry, uh, is also about the fact that when you thinker, you know, when you think about MacGyver, all these, you know, kind of uh, uh, thinkers, you think about these people, you know, in a kind of, uh, you know, sitting in a room and, you know, playing with some tools kind of thing, separated from the rest of the world, but actually thinkering should also involve customers. And here I think one example I like to give is SAP Labs India, uh, which is an R&D lab of SAP, they have about, uh, 15, I believe, around the world. And uh, the SCP Labs India was run until recently by this very young man. He became the MD, managing director of that at 35. He's still very boyish, as you can see. Feroz, a good friend of mine. And uh, what he set up is that, you know, they are German, right? 
So SAP. So that means you know long development cycles. Everything has to be over engineered, over tested before they put in the marketplace. Otherwise, it's a bad image for them, kind of thing. But he said no because you know now the pace of software development has to accelerate. So he brought in essentially this notion of design thinking. He combined design thinking with the notion of agile development, as you know, this approach to developing software faster. He combined it and he created a physical space called App House within the lab. The idea is to bring together different uh, functions, marketing, engineering, and uh, R&D, and communications, and, and everyone together, including customers, and to develop solutions much faster within a 90 day cycle instead of two year cycle, okay? And what is amazing is that they found that employee productivity went up. Because remember that in emerging markets, the average age of the software engineer in SAP Labs India is 27. So, you, so these are the young kids that don't want to wait two years to develop software. They want to get going quickly, right? So this was an environment that boosted the productivity because they can innovate faster, better, cheaper, not only to create business products, but they also use this to create social stuff, do the CSR products as well, like a platforms for charities to exchange their you know, assets or gain access to specific skills. So this is also, I think, the message is that even a software company, sometimes you know, the danger is that you know, we take too long to develop solutions. And this is a good example I described in my book about how do you kind of you know, create an environment to innovate faster, better, cheaper as well, even in the software space. Number five is um, another way you can accelerate the tinkering process is also by buying some company, by to bring in some new blood that has this tinkering mindset. And one company that has done it is Saatchi & Saatchi, which is a very well-known advertising firm. They work with Apple, among others, in the early years of Apple. Um, and uh, except that they realize something is that, you know, running an ad campaign today in the era of social media, you guys know better than me, uh, you can't take six months like the average time it takes, you know, in the old days, right, with the print and uh, TV kind of medium. Now you have to innovate faster ad campaigns have to be coordinated and launched very faster. So for that, they realized that they need a new approach to innovation in a marketing space that is also you know, very much like a MacGyver style. So for that, they acquired this company called Duke, which is a digital advertising company. And uh, they're headquartered near Paris. I want to see them. This is what the office looks like, you know, open space, uh, very zen-like. Um, and it's very interesting because you have almost like a two generations here. You have the creative types who come from the traditional advertising background from Saatchi and Saatchi, and then you have the 20-somethings who come from Duke, right? And that what they are doing essentially is two things. One is to see how the digital guys can take an existing campaign and optimize it using social media. That means implement the campaign faster, better, cheaper. The second thing they do is say, look at emerging technologies in the social media and mobility and see how these technologies can be used to create new offerings in the advertising space, okay? So this is the other thing you can do is, you know, if you cannot tinker by yourself, bring in some fresh new blood that can, you know, accelerate this process. The other thing you can do, number six, is um, create some positive constraints. Because the example I gave, right, in emerging markets is that people don't have not many resources, so that becomes a stimulus for innovation. So here, you know, we have electricity, we have a lot of resources, you know, so you might say, how do I create constraints? You can do it. Because think about the scarcest resource we have in the, in the developed economies. Can anyone guess what it is? Very good. Wow, you are really smart. My goodness, I'm impressed. Yes, time is the scarcest resource we have, right? We all already run out of time. So what you do is you do hackathons, right? You heard about that. You create a constraint on time. You say, I only have 24 hours, and you have to come up with the, the good enough solution. Not the best solution, good enough solution. That's also important, right? So Aetna, which is a large uh, healthcare insurance company in the East Coast, regularly hosts since uh, last year these hackathons. This was one they did uh, last year to bring in designers and uh, software engineers to uh, not experts, right? Anyone was interested to actually co-create solutions for elderly people, right? Think about like, you know, what are the healthcare services elderly people need? And then think about also the user interface for medical devices that would be more appropriate for elderly people. And within a weekend, they came up with more ideas they could have ever done in a year long, you know, process, right? Uh, and this is important because with Obamacare, What's going to happen is that 50 million people, right, and Americans lacking insurance entering the system. 
Aetna realizes that they have to innovate faster, better, cheaper to come up with affordable solutions for these 50 million Americans. So that's also another reason why they believe that the traditional suppliers, big medical device companies and pharma companies, cannot help them innovate that quickly. So that's why they're organizing these hackathons to bring in third-party developers, et cetera, to come up with new, fresh ideas to serve this underserved market that is going to be joining the healthcare system. Um, so the message, therefore, is like, you know, you can create these positive constraints where the constraints don't stifle too much and yet creates enough space for people to come up with some great ideas. The second, seventh uh, uh, best practice is that, you know, when people thinker, it's very cool for CEOs to say, yeah, 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 I like tinkering and I allow people to tinker. And the problem is the moment there's a failure, they immediately like, you know, come down on these guys, you know, or the gals and say, oh, that was a bad idea, you know, why do you do that? You know, it was a stupid thing to do. But some companies actually try to, uh, you know, celebrate these, you know, successes, but also failures. For example, uh, Ratan Tata, as I said, the Tata Group, they have a failure award given every year. So there's a big award, you know, very glitzy room like this, and they give an award to someone who tried and failed. And the only thing they ask them in five minutes to describe the lessons they learned from that failure, okay? It's called the failure award. And the, in, the, in the Netherlands, there is even, I believe, the failure institute, I believe, uh, where they try to actually bring people who tried, failed, and see what they learned from it. Because in America, we tend to always, we like the heroes, you know, people who, who always succeeded, but sometimes we also realize that learning applies also to failures, so we need to celebrate that. Um, and uh, Bui Construction, uh, one of in Europe's largest construction firm, also realizes that some of the tinkering happens not just in the, you know, in the, in the, in the headquarters or among the senior executives, or a lot of tinkering happens in the field as well. So they created this uh, interesting new uh, award program that celebrates uh, innovation done by construction workers people who may not even have you know, an advanced degree, but came up with this very ingenious you know, MacGyver stuff, right, to optimize their work. And they tried to bubble them up and give them recognition. Because sometimes the frontline employees, right, also have ideas, but we don't celebrate that. Um, so think about that. Second thing is also try to engage young people in the tinkering process. I actually think that the generation Y and Z are natural MacGyvers. Uh, because they are known as generation recession. <laughs> uh, they grew up you know, in the tough times, economic times. So they know how to do more with less and how to deal with adversity. And now there are some programs that are teaching these young kids how to think in that kind of MacGyver fashion. This is near us in Stanford. Uh, it's a program that is taught by James Patel, a professor there, where they bring in uh, young MBA students and uh, young uh, engineers to co-create solutions that will cost only 1% of equivalent products in the marketplace. For example, this is a product they came up with. It's just for uh, premature babies, right? When they're born, we put them in these incubators. And these incubators cost about $20,000 and are very energy inefficient, consume a lot of energy. But you see, the real problem with incubators is that it doesn't allow the mother to have a physical contact with the kid which is important for the survival, right, of the kid. And that's not feasible today. So this kind of solution in emerging markets is totally useless, right? People don't have access to electricity, um, and it's very expensive to operate. Um, so Jane Chen, who is a Stanford MBA, uh, came up with this very interesting invention that I brought in here. It's called uh, Embrace. It's a portable infant warmer that cost only $200 which means 1% of the equivalent incubator in the marketplace. And it's very simple to operate and use because what it does is that it has this uh, phase change material which looks like a wax, hard, and you just drop it in boiling water because in villages in Africa, China, India, they don't have electricity, right? You drop in boiling water, it melts, and you put it back here, and it keeps the baby warm at constant temperature for six hours straight. But the real value is that finally the mother can hold the baby right, against her, which is really the kangaroo care, we call it, which is important for the survival of the baby. So this is, again, interesting because this was conceived in Stanford, prototyped at tech shop in Menlo Park nearby, and then being uh, manufactured in India, Africa, and China. 
right? And that's what I mean also is that, you know, tinkering is happening on a global scale as well right now. But again, it's driven by these young people. Um, and, uh, and young people, I think, are, I'm Gen X, I'm really ashamed to say this, but one of the problems with Gen X is that we complained a lot, we never really did anything about, you know, what we complain about. But I think the younger people, one advantage they have, unlike our generation, is that they are very good at mobilizing networks. And uh, so we see now new movements starting. This is called Design for America, which made it to the kind of cover of Fast Company. Uh, this is a program which, is, which consists in creating every state in this country, 50 states, uh, a design studio where young people will come together to look at within the local neighborhood, what are the big issues in healthcare, transportation, energy, and solve these problems in a very frugal way, in a MacGyver fashion, without requiring big resources. And uh, the founders of uh, Design DFA is uh, Yuri Malina and Mert Izeri. You see them here. They're sitting in a small cubicle, and uh, yet they are making a big impact in healthcare industry. For example, um, they looked at the problem that uh, 100 million Americans every year die of uh, infection acquired during a hospital visit, right? And the reason for that is because, not because the doctors want to deliberately kill the patients, uh, it's just that doctors, as you know, are very busy. And they don't have time to stop by a hand sanitation station, right, to stop and wash the hands. They're always busy, right, from one patient visit to another one. So they looked at this problem and they said, okay, what's the real problem is that doctors don't have time to stop to wash the hands. But one thing that doctors always do, as you know, is like kids, they tend to kind of, you know, wash their hands like this, right, by scrubbing, rubbing their hands, you know, on their, on their, on their, on their uniform. And um, so they came up with this called Swipe Sense, which is a little device you attach to your, you know, your doctor uniform, and you just have to like roll on, you know, you just roll over and then dispense the liquid, and then you wash on the go, okay? It cost two bucks to make it, and they made it with the 3D printer, and this is the new version, six year a bit, and looks like a you know, clamshell, you know, kind of, you know, mouse. So the message is that young people are actually taking over these very complex issues, 100,000 Americans dying every year, without requiring a big laboratory to come up with solutions. So think about also either hiring these kids or finding a way to collaborate with them as well. Um, and uh, one young kid that uh, I met him uh, last week in Delhi, uh, I don't, does anyone know who he is? His name is uh, Jack Andraka. Uh, he's from Maryland, and uh, at 14 years old, uh, he invented uh, a test kit for pancreatic cancer. Uh, and this test kit cost 26,000 times cheaper than existing system, and can do the test 168 times faster. Only six cents, and it can do the test in five minutes, okay? So that's what's happening is that, you know, essentially you have these young kids now who can deal with these big issues. And what's a fa well, funny story, and that's why I put the title, right? The real story is this. And, and he won the Intel uh, Science Prize. You can Google it. And uh, he was even with Obama and everything. You know, amazing kid. Still a kid. You know, he's only 16 now. And, you know, he's still, you know, very, very amazing guy. Good energy. But the real message is that look at the title, right? What happens is we think them as kids. So when he applied to 100 professors in different universities in America, asking them, can I come work in your lab? Because I have an idea, I tested it, I want to make it better. 99% professor rejected him. They thought he had a crazy idea. Only one guy in John Hopkins University picked him up, and the rest is history, right? So think about also that, right? You know, are you investing in these young people uh, who you might think actually have crazy ideas, but might come up with these revolutionary solutions, right? So think about that as well. Um, and sometimes even young kids can be, this is the Generation Z. Uh, this is a long story short, this is a major retailer in Europe, I can name which one, hired actually uh, young uh, high school kids to redesign the cutlery for, they also sell uh, you know, food items in their store, retail stores, and they wanted to redesign them for elderly people. Uh, because in Europe, population is aging, so they wanted to rethink about you know, cutlery that will be more easy to use. So they brought in these young kids, and in the, user fo in the focus groups, they discovered that the solution that young kids proposed were far better accepted than the stuff that the in-house designers came up with. Okay? So again, right, you know, we always, uh, Gen X, you know, we always think like, ah, oh, the kids, like, you know, they don't know anything. But actually, they are very intuitive, right? And, and I think, you know, when we say about ingenu ingenuity, uh, there's a, 
the root of the word is ingenuous. There's ingenuous, which means like, you know, this innocence. And that's really important, right? Because they don't have the baggage like we have. So they are able to ask these big what if questions or like, why not, right? We never ask the question, why not? We always ask the question, how? The moment someone goes from, it goes in hierarchy, right? The why not leads to the most disruptive questions, disruptive innovation. Why needs to equally disruptive. The moment you go from asking the why question to how and what, that's it, end of the world, <laughs> okay? So ask yourself every day, like, you know, am I asking the question why not or how, right? Um, and uh, finally, the ninth uh, kind of practice, and I have one more and I will close on that, is one way you can learn to thinker, I think, is by going to emerging markets, either leave there for a couple of years, or if you're a leader, send your, uh, you know, your deputies to go leave there as well. Why? Simply because you can see that, you know, we are right now here, and see what's going to happen within a few decades is that all the middle class, globally speaking, is going to shift from mature economies to the emerging markets. As a matter of fact, you can see that there are already about 300 million uh, middle class consumers in China alone, the equivalent of the size of this country, right, population-wise. So that means that you need to really begin to expose your executives and yourself to the new realities of how to innovate in these very resource-constrained environments like India, China, Africa, and Brazil. And that's really what um, this company, Renault Nissan, is trying to do. Um, Renault, as you know, is a French car maker, as you may not know them, but you know their alliance partner, Nissan. And, um, and it's an amazing company because uh, two weeks ago, I think they now become the third largest car maker in the world. And they will become probably second in the next three years, in my opinion. And uh, the former CEO, Louis Schweitzer, came up with this uh, 5,000 euro car in 2005. It's called the Logan, uh, which then got extended into a broader set of products called the Dacia brand. And uh, funnily, they thought this product will sell primarily in emerging markets, but it has become a bestseller in Western Europe. It's selling like hotcakes to the point, to the, to the, to the point where 40% of revenues now come from these low-end products. They never expected that to happen. Because of the crisis, this has become a huge cash cow for them. And then the current CEO, uh, Carlos Ghosn, is taking it to the next level. Uh, and he coined this term called frugal engineering. And you will see in the book, there's a detailed case study on them. Don't worry about it. You can read more about it in the book. But the message is that he's taking it to the next level by actually, uh, and I had the pleasure to launch my book with him in New York in 2012. And what he explained is that he's taking the guy, the chief engineer, would design this uh, Logan vehicle, 5,000 euro car, to say, okay, you did it, awesome. What if you can create a car that is twice cheaper, <laughs> right? Like, like 2,500 euros, right? Well, you cannot do that in Europe because you know, the context you know, is not the same, right? You have too many resources. You cannot really think outside the box. So he dispatched him to go live in southern India, where he's developing now. Uh, first of all, he's exposing himself any of you who have been to these emerging markets, you know how bad the traffic situation can get. So that there's empathy, you know, first of all, with emerging market consumers to see how difficult it is to navigate this traffic mess. Uh, and then use that customer insight to come up with the whole new car platform. It's called the CMFA. And this is gonna be shared between Renault and Nissan to create a new segment of vehicles that are going to be ultra low cost that will be sold around the world starting next year. Uh, the final thing I want to close on is that, you know, tinkering is not a professional activity. Think about it also in your private life. And I love this thing in San Francisco, it's Berkeley, I believe, it's called Hacker Moms, where moms can come with the kids, there is a nursery for kids, and uh, moms can then, you know, play with these, you know, become the, you know, the, the MacGyver, you know, themselves. So I think that's what I want to leave you with is, you know, you know don't be MacGyver just Monday to Friday, 8 to 5. Try to also be MacGyver, you know, evenings and weekends as well. And if possible, bring your entire family with you to do that. So thank you so much.